Hey, welcome to another episode of Specialty Crops Corner with Brad Bergeford. Brad Bergeford is a horticulture specialist and an extension educator at the Ohio State University South Centers. Brad uh, is going to be talking about production of hops, so stay tuned. Welcome to another episode of Specialty Crops Corner with Brad Burgerford. Brad, it's always a pleasure listening to the different uh, parts of the Im- information, especially about hops production. Uh, I-, I found it very interesting, all the different things that it requires in growing this specialty crop. Yeah, Patrick, uh, folks uh, are always learning of new high-value specialty crops that can be grown in Ohio. It just seems like folks are just used to our traditional corn, soybeans, wheat, but there are a lot of high-value specialty crops, especially for our small farms that can generate some pretty decent income off of small acreage farms. And one of those crops that we've been researching and helping growers adopt uh, has been hops. And we have a number of different microbreweries that have started in, in Ohio, what, over 180? Oh, yeah, and I think we're actually uh, over, we're over 200 now that actually 200. have licenses. And then there's many more waiting in the wind to uh, get licenses from the Department of Commerce Division of Liquor Control. So that's our main market. You're correct. Hops can really just be used for, for uh, brewing and beer production, though a few folks have branched out into some other creams and some uh, other uh, making pillows out of them. One of my farmers, uh, his wife makes pillows out of hops, sh- oh. stuffs the pillow full of hops, and actually uh, you can sleep really well without having to drink a beer because the hops <laughs> actually have some properties that help you with sleeping. So uh, last week we uh, introduced uh, how we got into bringing back this industry to Ohio, which as we mentioned last week, Patrick, we, we grew hops here 100 years ago. So when we say new specialty crops, it's not really a new specialty crop, but like you mentioned, with this resurgence with craft brewing throughout the nation and the world, that's opened up a whole new opportunity for our farmers because we're getting a lot of local neighborhood uh, craft breweries popping up. And just like with the local produce uh, demand, the local brewery demand, the local uh, brewery consumers want to know what ingredients and where those ingredients are made or produced for their beer. And by locally growing hops, we can provide that local hop to the brewery. So I'm just going to go over a little bit about what it takes to grow some uh, hops. We, we talked about how we got into it and some of the history behind hops production. And I think we left last week with, a, this is a picture of our research plots that we have. Um, at the OSU South Centers, uh, we needed some unbiased research-based information. Plus, we want to learn how to do this ourselves. So we actually put three plantings on OSU property throughout Ohio. The biggest planting is uh, down at the OSU South Centers at Piketon. But then we also have a planting just like the one you see on this picture uh, up at our OERDC, our Ohio Ag Research and Development Center up at Worcester, Ohio. And then we have another private partner uh, a partnership with a uh, the Ag Incubator Foundation or AIF uh, up in Bowling Green, Ohio, that has worked with OSU on lots of agricultural products for Northwest Ohio. So we have the same exact hop yard uh, located up at Bowling Green, just to see if hops can be produced at uh, throughout the state. And and we've learned over the last uh, ten years that yes, we can produce hops throughout Ohio. Those of you that maybe aren't familiar with what a hops plant looks like. There she is, and I say she because all the hop plants grown in the hop yard or in the hop field are female plants, and the female plant produces the hop cone, which is a flower cone, and those are all the little green, small little things you see hanging on that plant. Uh, Those are what go into the beer. Um, So the female plant produces the hop cones, and that's what we harvest are the hop cones so they will get about 20 foot tall like we went over last week and they grow up a uh coir twine coconut coir twine um and that twine is supported and attached to aircraft cable that goes across the uh the, the telephone poles that we have throughout the hop yard to build the trail how many uh cones are there on each tree um 
we have we have taken cone numbers, but there's a lot on, and we don't really call them a tree. We call them a bine, B-I-N-E. It's sort of like a vine, but this vine actually has little tendrils on it and puts out uh, lateral shoots. So the cones are actually produced on those lateral shoots. And I don't know about numbers, but when you look at weight, a good yield our farmers shoot for is two pounds of dry cones per plant, and we plant a thousand plants to the acre. So a, a good yield, which we have excelled that, we've done less than that, but a good yield is about 2,000 pounds of dried per acre um, at harvest, and hops range in price anywhere from six dollars a pound to thirty dollars a pound depending on the variety so when you take those average prices times roughly two thousand pounds you're talking some pretty good income per acre so what i'm going to do is just outline you had mentioned patrick how the hops are used in the brewing industry i'm uh, this picture here is from uh, michigan state university uh, rob serine dr serine is a a partner of mine, actually, we got a meeting here with him at noon talking hops. We get together once a month and talk hops. But uh, um, he put this slide together just to lay out the value chain of hops, uh, what all that hop has to go through before it gets into that bottle of craft beer that uh, everybody likes to consume. So um, as you can see in the top left corner there, that's the hop field, just like the picture I showed you. And the big key to using hops is analysis. We, uh, brewers, I've never been a brewer, but brewers uh, re re rely on that hop analysis. The analysis consists of um, uh, the percent of alpha acids, beta acids, humulone, cohumulone, all the chemical properties that it takes to make beer. So just like a baker has a recipe for their cookies or their cakes, a brewer has a recipe for their certain styles of beer. And the analysis of those hops is what the brewer uses to make that beer. So an analysis is the number one determination of what, uh, when a farmer is going to harvest. So when the crop is starting to reach maturity, which here in southern Ohio, end of July, first part of August, northern Ohio, uh, end of July, uh, or end of, uh, middle of the end of August, early part of September is when the harvest is going on up there. But we want to have an analysis done. And we have a lab down at South Centers of Python that we can run the, uh, the analysis on those hops, but a lot of growers will send them to commercial labs as well. So once the, the hops hit the magic number for alpha acids, beta acids, humulone, cohumulone, then that determines when we harvest. Um, so you'll see the field, we get an analysis done, we go in and either hand harvest or most of our hops are now machine harvested. We still have to cut them all by hand. The plant has to be cut, but we go ahead and put that plant through a machine. And we'll talk about harvesting here next week. Um, but then it goes down to the picking machine. That's, a, that's one of the many types of machines our farmers have to pick the hops. And then if you're gonna make a green brew or a harvest ale, that's where you use fresh hops right from the plant within 24 hours. Then it goes from the picking machine into the brewery. And there's where they make that harvest ale. Prior to us bringing hops back to Ohio, um, almost 10 years ago, Ohio breweries could not make a harvest ale because to get hops from the Pacific Northwest where majority are made, it takes longer than 24 hours. And a brewer wants those, has to have those hops within 24 hours so they're fresh going into the brew kettle. So that's the quick value chain. We harvest, do analysis, or we do analysis, harvest, then it goes right to the brew kettle where we make uh, uh, harvest ales or green brews. Now that is a seasonal beer, so you're not going to sustain hop sales or the brewing industry just doing a seasonal ale. It's a high value ale, but it's not going to be sustainable throughout the year. So then for the second type of hops, they will go through a drying process. So instead of going right to the brewery, they will be picked, go into a drying room. Like you see the drying barn there. Those rooms can be either a big barn like the one you see there, or they could be a smaller size version. Then once they come out of that drying room, they are conditioned, which means they're cooled down, uh, brought back to an ambient temperature. And then if you don't have the storage space, because these need to go into a cooler ASAP, 
uh, just like with produce, they're gonna, they can't heat up or they'll rot. Um, so we, some farmers will go ahead and bale those hops. They'll take all those hop cones, smash them together, um, and put them into a bale, and then the bale is put into the cooler for later processing. Um, once they come out of that, uh, once they come out of that baler, we want to run another analysis on them um, because during that drying process, we're using some heat, and sometimes that heat can actually. Uh, um, reduce some of the chemical properties like the alpha acids, the beta acids, if, if it's not done right. So when you dry your hops, you do a two-step analysis and we'll do another one right after drying, right after baling. And then as we got time, we'll go ahead and put the hops through a hammer mill and a pelletizer. The standard uh, in, for the industry, for the brewing industry, is to use pellets. So if anybody's familiar with dog food or rabbit food or cat food, um, they pelletize that food into those small pellets. That's the same thing we're doing here. We're taking those hops, hammer them out, smashing them up, and then running them through a, a, a pelletizer that turns them into little pellets. So you'll get a whole bunch of those hops all compressed into a pellet. And that's what a, a pelletizer looks like. And we'll go over that a little bit more in depth next next week again. Um, once they come out of that pelletizer, then they go immediately into a nitrogen infused mylar pack like you see in the top right corner. Just like when you have a bag of potato chips, Patrick, you open up that bag of potato chips and always goes that little, you always hear that little puff of air come out. That's actually nitrogen. They nitrogen infuse uh, potato chips in mylar bags to prevent the sun uh, from in the sunlight and the light from penetrating that pack because that sunlight will actually break down and the air getting into that pack will break down the potato chips or the hops. So we use a mylar pack, just like they use mylar packs on potato chips. And right before that pack is sealed with the hops inside of it, a shot of nitrogen is, is shot in there, just like they do on the potato chips. And then that nitrogen stabilizes that hop in cold storage in the cooler. And you could, sure with time, the hop has a tendency to reduce the number of chemical properties in it. But by storing it in a mylar nitrogen infused pack in cold freezer storage, we could get uh, several years of storage out of those hops. Then we pull them out of the cold storage and we take them directly to the brewer throughout the year as they need them. Brewers don't have a lot of freezer storage in their breweries. I don't know if you've ever been in a brewery, Patrick, but they're pretty small. They just have little tiny storage spaces. So usually the farmer will store the hops on their farm in freezers and then make their rounds once a month and make the deliveries to the breweries. Um, so like I said, the hops are, the, that's what we're harvesting. That little tiny cone makes about two pounds of dried per plant. And it's the one that it has, it gives the, the hops give that beer its, its aroma, its, its citrusy taste, its fruity aroma, all the things that anybody that knows anything about craft beer, the craft brew connoisseurs will know that uh, hops are what make that. Uh, in, this is a cross section of a hop, uh, Patrick, and see that one that's cut in half there, all that yellow stuff in there? That's called a uh, lupulin. And inside the hop cone are these lupulin glands. And in the lupulin glands, the, our, the lupulin is produced. And you know what? It's not really that green thing. It's the lupulin that makes the beer. The lupulin that's inside that cone is what gives that beer its citrusy, florally, all the taste and smells that a, a good craft beer has. It's all related back to the lupulin. So when those cones tested, we're testing the lupulin, not the cone itself. You were talking about different varieties. How many different kinds of hops, how many different varieties of hops are there? Worldwide, there's hundreds and hundreds of varieties. Here in Ohio, we're continually experimenting, and then the breweries always determine that too. They'll come up with a new beer that needs a new variety of hops, so then there's where we come in to test that variety, make sure we can produce it, but there are literally hundreds of varieties throughout the world, and I'd say in Ohio, we're raising about 25 to 30 between, uh, on my research farm, we have about 25, but I know commercially throughout the state, our farmers are producing uh, 25 to 30 different varieties. But there's, a, there's another, see that, see that yellow powder? That's the lupulin. So that was that from one of our cones at harvest. Uh, and so that's the little yellow sticky stuff that makes the beer uh, taste and smell just like uh, we want it to taste. There's what pellets look like. 
after we run them through that palletizer, we compress them. And basically it's because they take up less room. Um, they do say sometimes when you palletize that hop, you um, don't get the release of all the lupulin because it's compacted there. But once that uh, pellet's thrown into a brew kettle, uh, it expands and everything is released. Uh, so um, if you're really moving large volumes of, of hops, pelletizing is how the brewers will want to buy it. Um, so again, we're getting, we're getting to the close of uh, today's session, Patrick. But again, just to recap, uh, hops are a perennial plant. They can be in production. There's 100-year-old hop yards in Germany. But, you know, we're looking at 15, 18, 20 years of, of real productivity coming out of a hop field. Um, we plant them in rows. Uh, we plant them with plants, not with seeds. Like I mentioned, they're binds. The plant is called a bind, and it has these uh, little uh, uh, laterals on it that it grabs onto the string and pulls itself up that 20 feet up in the air. Uh, do need drip irrigation, fertigation, just like we've talked about here in several programs, how important that is, especially crops. It's very important to hops as well. Um, there's a lot of disease and insect management. Uh, we've mentioned a few last week, but we'll go and have another sex, uh, session. One of our sessions, we'll just go over diseases, and another session, we'll go over the insect uh, um, problems that we have that a farmer should should be in mind, keep in mind when they're growing hops. Um, usually around March, you'll see that perennial hop plants start breaking dormancy and starting to emerge from the field. And like I said, we harvest the all, Southern Ohio will harvest in August, Northern Ohio will harvest the end of August into September. And then just to recap, there's, the hops are sold three ways. Uh, fresh whole cone, that's what we use for the wet, wet hop beer, the green beer, or the harvest ales. And then dried whole cone, that's mainly for dry hopping. And then the pelletized market where that cone is just compressed into a pellet. So really my farmers in Ohio, they're all selling directly to the breweries, which is a form of direct to consumer marketing. Instead of going through brokers and a farmer getting not much money for their hops, by the, the farmers selling directly to the breweries, uh, they're making a little bit more money that way. So with that, I think uh, this is how we ended last week, and this is how we ended this week, uh, Patrick, is uh, things you need to keep in mind, and we'll start addressing these over the next few weeks. Uh, we need to, uh, some of the challenges we need to address are moisture, erosion, soil content in terms of plant uh, uh, nutrition, and then plant nutrition, uh, sunlight, how do we maximize sunlight in that plant canopy, pest control, setting up your trellis, timing of our harvesting and our harvest labor, and then some of the food safety guidelines when it comes to, because this is a fresh crop. It's just like radishes or tomatoes or anything else. We have to follow food safety gu guidelines from uh, the FDA as well as our hot department of agriculture. So we'll go more in depth, uh, Patrick, on future programs about some of these other challenges. But do you have any questions today for me? I, I know we touched upon it last week, but you need male and female plants together. Uh, do you uh, actually, I corrected you last week. We don't want male and female plants together, Patrick. Back in the old days, we used to have males and females growing in the same hop yard. But when we do have the same plant growing in the same hop yard, they cross pollinate. So then those little hop cones will have black seeds in them. And when the brewery uses them to make beer, there's black seeds floating in, their, in the beer. So maybe 100 years ago, people didn't care about the black seeds floating in their beer. But today's beer consumer, eh, that's not going to go over well. So we do not have males and females in the same hop yard. And you can tell the difference. They just, physiology of the plant, they look different. So when a farmer does, by mistake, get a male in the hop yard, uh, that's the end of that male plant's life because we do not want any males in the hop yard. We don't want seeds in our hops and seeds in our beer. Brewers would frown on that. How does a plant, a hop plant, pollinate? Um, actually, in our breeding yards, we will have male and females together. We don't have any breeding yards ourselves, but out west where they do a lot of the breeding, they will cross-pollinate males and females out there. I have one farmer that does mess around with a little bit of breeding here in Ohio. So yes, the bees will work those blooms. Now the wind will cross pollinate them. Um, 
but we we don't because we're not wanting to produce seed we just want to produce that cone we want to harvest it right before the peak of maturity um so we'll even if they do cross pollinate they'd never mature enough they never um the seeds would not be viable though they'd be in there they'd not be viable so we as farmers growing just for the brewing industry don't need cross pollination but our breeders do need that cross pollination to occur and it occurs both from insects as well as from the wind so if i were to start a, a hops acre uh, i would be buying uh, plants that already have cones that will be coming in you will all you will be buying plants that have been vegetatively propagated which means you take cuttings off of that mother plant and you start the plant let you root it and then we will take a clone that's called a clone we'll take a clone of that mother plant that has all the properties the brewery likes and we farmers then buy that clone plant and plant that into our hop yard before we start planting we should talk with a brewer as to what kind of uh, plants uh, we will be starting yeah, we call them varieties. So we will actually, the brewers know what varieties they want because that's why we have almost 300 breweries in the state because each one makes their own beer and they use different varieties of hops. So yeah, you definitely want to talk to your brewery first. Like they're in Portsmouth. Uh, you would want to talk to Tony, who's the head brewer at the Portsmouth Brewing Company. And he will tell you the styles that they predominantly produce, the styles of beer and what varieties of hops that they use and they can actually even tell you how many pounds they go through. So as a farmer, we can really plan our production just by talking to that brewery uh, uh, well in advance of planting. You know, water is always an issue, uh, but in Southern Ohio, we seem to get a lot of, a lot of uh, water in the spring and early uh, summer, but then as it, it progresses to August and September, we don't get as much water. Usually shuts down. If you look at our historical rainfall averages from the data collected there at Piketon, yes, we get pretty dry in August and September right when the plant needs it the most because that's when it's making that hop cone. So if that plant went into a drought stress situation at any point, we would mess up the lupulin, which would mess up the chemical analysis, which would make that crop not usable by the brewer. I know we need a lot of water for, for each acre, et cetera. Does, uh, Hops plants require more than the average. I, I think uh, 27,500 pounds of, or gallons of water is needed for an acre of any specialty crop. But how about hops? Do they need yeah, more? Yeah, we'll have a special addition on just uh, irrigating and fertigating for hops. They're using some of our research-based information we gathered there from Piketon. But hops actually require three times that amount, Patrick, just because at 27,000 is for a low growing, like a pepper plant or a melon plant. Then you take a 20 foot tall plant, you just times it by three. So <laughs> you, you need a lot more water than you use for our traditional uh, horticulture crops. But you know, since we've been doing this research, Patrick, there at Piketon, we have found out that a lot of the traditional pests we have in our traditional corn and soybean crops also will attack the hops. So we did not realize that European corn borer that gets on our corn crop would attack hops. They did last year. We did not realize that the spider mite that attacks our soybean crops will also attack our hops plants, which we've learned over the last 10 years. So, but then hops have their own set of pests as well. And we'll talk about those in a future program. Okay. Well, you know, you know Brad, uh, you have a lot of great information about uh, many of the different specialty crops. Uh, on your on your farm, do you grow hops? On no, no. Uh, we are we are now empty nesters, and all my good labor, my three boys and my and my daughter, are now have flown the coop and are off with jobs and at school and doing their own thing. So, no, it requires so much labor that uh, being empty nesters and semi-retired from farming, uh, me and my wife probably aren't really ready to take on the high labor demand of a hop crop at this point. Uh, if, if your children were still with you, would yeah. you grow? It would great. We would raise hops. Yep. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> and the labor intense, 
uh, it's labor intensive in picking the cones, correct? Um, that's very labor intensive, but like right now, our great research crew there at Python just finished dropping all the new strings and every plant. Uh, you train three, four, five plants to each string. So that plant has to be hand woven around each string. So you take a thousand plants to the acre, you train three, four, five plants per string. That's 5,000 times you have to bend down on your hands and knees, take that plant, wrap it around, get it growing up the string. Um, and then there's a lot, a lot of other maintenance to do as well. So those are just, yeah, harvest is a very busy time. But this time of the year is very busy in terms of labor hmm. demands. Hmm. Uh, that's interesting. Well, yeah, I, again, I really appreciate the uh, information on the hops. And I look forward to next week when you're going to be talking more in depth about the hops and the production. Yep. Here with uh, Brad Burgerford. Brad is a horticulture specialist uh, and also an extension educator with the Ohio State University South Centers. Uh, this is a uh, episode of Specialty Crops Corner.